In this video, we will discuss the very second important step in urine formation that is tubular reabsorption and secretion. The first important step was glomerular filtration that we have already discussed in our previous videos. The objective so far this video will be first we will summarize reabsorption and secretion in various parts of the nephrons. Then we will outline the basic principles of tubular reabsorption and we will explain tubular reabsorption and secretion in detail in the proximal convoluted tubule. This is a nephron as you all know, nephron has various parts, the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting tubules and collecting duct. The loop of Henle is further divided into thick dis descending portion, thin descending portion, thin ascending portion and thick ascending portion. So what happens that there are millions of nephrons in both kidneys and the glomerular filtration that is produced by all nephrons of both kidneys is about 180 liters per day. So all of this filtrate is being excreted from the body, is it so? No, only about 0.8 to 2 liters of the total glomerular filtrate is being excreted from the body. So what happens to the rest of the 99% of the filtrate that has been filtered into the nephrons? This filtrate is being reabsorbed by different parts of the nephrons. So it is very interesting that almost 180 liters per day of the filtrate is produced each day by all the nephrons of both kidneys and among them only about 0.8 to 2 liters is excreted per day from the human body. The rest of all the filtrate is being reabsorbed back again into the blood. We know that filtration is a relatively non-selective process. Almost all of the solutes is being filtered out of the glomerulus into the woman's capsule, except for the plasma proteins and the cellular elements. While the reabsorption is a highly selective process. It involves a lot of uh, proteins, transport proteins, and active, passive, and facilitated diffusion process. Let's see the selective reabsorption and secretion of various substances in different parts of the nephrons. So first of all, we have the proximal convoluted tubule. The substances that are being reabsorbed from the proximal convoluted tubule include sodium, chloride, bicarbonate ions, potassium ions, water, glucose, amino acids, phosphates and other substances. So almost 65% of the filtered load is being reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. The substances that are being secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule includes hydrogen ions, organic acids and basis, for example, para acid. The substances that are being reabsorbed from the loop of Henle, the descending part of the, the descending thin segment of the loop of the Henle includes water. Both of these proximal convoluted tubule and the descending limb of the loop of Henle are highly permeable to water. So they avidly reabsorb water back into the blood. Let's come to the ascending limb of the loop of the Henle. The thin segment of ascending limb of loop of Henle is going to secrete urea into the tubular lumen. This part is not permeable to water, so there is no reabsorption of water from this segment. The thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, this is important for the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium and almost about 25% of the filtered load of sodium is being reabsorbed by the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Again, it is very important to remember that this part is totally impermeable to water, so no water is being reabsorbed from this segment. Then comes the distal convoluted tubule, the early portion of the distal convoluted tubule. It is important for the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, magnesium, and calcium. Almost about 5% of the filtered load of sodium is being reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule. The late part of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts are important for the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, bicarb, and water. 
again it is important to remember that this part is impermeable to water it becomes permeable to water only in the presence of antidiuretic hormone the substances that are being secreted into the late distal tubule and the collecting tubules are hydrogen and potassium from the medullary collecting ducts the portion of the collecting duct that is located in the medulla it is important for the reabsorption of urea and water again in the presence of antidiuretic hormone in the absence of this hormone this portion is again impermeable to water the sub substance that is being secreted into this portion is again hydrogen ions so this is again important to remember that the early portions of the nephron till the descending part of the loop of henle is very permeable to water while the later segments are impermeable to water the collecting tubules and the distal cannulated tubule they become permeable to water only in the presence of a hormone which is called antidiuretic hormone so let's discuss the reabsorption of various substances in the proximal cannulated tubule in detail if we take a small segment of the proximal cannulated tubule and enlarge it we see the cells and various tubules like this what we have here is this is a tubular cell that is representing a cell of the proximal cannulated tubule and this is a second cell and the space between the two cells is called as intercellular space now um, this cell has been really simplified over here but in actual uh, this has a lot of uh, microvilli which is forming the brush border that increases the surface area for the process of reabsorption and secretion and this surface is called as the apical surface on the basal side uh, if we see under the microscope we can see the presence of a lot of mitochondria a lot of mitochondria are present on the basal side because they provide energy for the functioning of various active transporters that are located on these cells we will see okay on the the apical side is actually facing the tubular lumen this is the tubular lumen and the basal side is facing the interstitial space that then relates to the peritubular capillaries so the substances that are being reabsorbed are going to follow the route from here to here into the tubular cells into the interstitium and then from the interstitium they are going to move into the peritubular capillaries via bulk flow bulk flow is a process that is highly dependent on the starling forces so the starling forces at the level of glomerulus were in favor of filtration while the starling forces the hydrostatic pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure they are in favor of reabsorption at the peritubular capillaries so all the substances that are being reabsorbed are going to be re, are going to be reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries by, by the process of bulk flow the substances that are reabsorbed directly through the cells they are following a route which is called as transcellular route while the substances that are reabsorbed from between the cells the intercellular space this route is called as paracellular route now again uh, we have tight junctions over here but these tight junctions uh, are not so tight and they actually allow the movement of water and some solutes to pass through this route so this route through the cell is called as transcellular route and the route between the two cells is co called as paracellular route the process of reabsorption involves almost all the transport processes that is active transport both primary and secondary then diffusion simple both simple and facilitated diffusion we will see how these processes are involved in reabsorption in the proximal cannulated tubule let's start the process of reabsorption so uh, the very important pump that is located on the basal side of the membrane this is called as sodium potassium atypase pump as you all know that this pump functions to pump three sodium out of the cell and two potassium inside the cell this pump is located on both the basal side as well as the lateral surface of the tubular cell 
So on the lateral surface again, it is pumping three sodium out of the cell and two potassium inside the cell. So what is happening as there is flow of net positive charge out of the cell as the pumps are pumping three sodium out and two potassium in. So it leads to generation of a negative charge inside the cell. A negative charge of means um, minus 70 millivolts. The pumping of sodium out of the cell has created a chemical gradient for sodium while the again the pumping of sodium out of the cell has also created an electrical gradient. So both this chemical and electrical gradient is going to favor the movement of electrolytes from the tubular lumen into the tubular cells by a process of secondary active transport. So this active process is going to facilitate the movement of substances or solutes from the tubular lumen into the tubular cells and then from the tubular cells into the peritubular capillaries by the process of bulk flow. On the apical membrane, we can see another transporter which is called as sodium glucose transporter. S stands for sodium, GL stands for glucose and T stands for transporter. So we have two important such transporters, the sodium glucose transporter 2 that is located in the early parts of the proximal convoluted tubule and sodium glucose transporter 1 which is located in the later parts of the proximal convoluted tubule. This transporter is very important for the reabsorption of glucose along with sodium. So this is a secondary active transport process which is driven by the energy created by the primary active transport process. So sodium is moving into the tubular cells because of the electrochemical gradient created on the first hand by these active pumps. This sodium carries along with it a very important substance which is called glucose. So this process is called a sodium glucose co-transport with the help of the sodium glucose transporter. The glucose that moves inside the cell is then moved into the peritubular capillaries with the help of a facilitated process by the transporters which are called as glucose transporter. Again, in the early part glucose transporter 2 is located and in the later parts of the proximal convoluted tubule we have glucose transporter 1. And this is favoring the facilitated diffusion of glucose from the tubular cells into the peritubular capillaries. Almost around 100% of glucose is being reabsorbed into the proximal convoluted tubule, 90% uh, in the early portion and 10% in the late portions of proximal convoluted tubule. The reabsorption of uh, substances like amino acids, phosphate and lactate are also following this type of secondary active transport as by the glucose. So almost again 100% of amino acids are being reabsorbed into the proximal convoluted tubule through this co-transport process. So glucose, amino acids, phosphate and lactate are transported via co-transport mechanism with sodium with their respective pumps. Another important transporter that is located on the apical side of the tubular cell is called as sodium hydrogen exchanger and stands for sodium H for hydrogen E for exchanger. So this sodium hydrogen exchanger is again very important for the transport of another substance which is called hydrogen and this is a counter transport. In this sodium is going to be reabsorbed and in exchange for sodium another very important substance another very important ion hydrogen is being secreted into the tubular lumen. So what happens with this hydrogen ions? This is called sodium hydrogen counter transport and again this transport takes place because of the energy created on first part by the primary active transport. Sodium hydrogen exchange. Sodium is reabsorbed, hydrogen is secreted into the lumen. What happens to this hydrogen and it is how it is coupled to the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions. So we can see that the bicarbonate ions that are being filtered into the tubular lumen and are present here, they are going to combine with hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid then dissociates into water 
and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is very permeable through the membranes and easily cross them. So this because now carbon dioxide has high concentration over here. So it is going to move inside the cell. What happens that when it goes inside the cell, this carbon dioxide again combines with water in the water and it is then converted into carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid then dissociates into hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. So in this way, this hydrogen is again secreted into the lumen while the bicarbonate ions are reabsorbed into the interstitium and then into the peritubular capillaries. Again, this reabsorption of bicarbonate is a passive process. So this is how the bicarbonate ions that are being filtered into the lumen are reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries. As you remember that the proximal cannulated tubule is very permeable to water. So whenever all these solutes are going to be reabsorbed from the tubular lumen into the cell and then into the peritubular capillaries, it is going to decrease the concentration of solutes in this area and increase the concentration of solutes over here. So what do you think from where to where the water is going to move? Definitely from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So now water is going to osmotically move from the tubular lumen into the tubular cells through the process of osmosis. And this water is reabsorbed through both the tubular cells through the transcellular pathway, but most of this water is being reabsorbed through the paracellular pathway. So um, the reabsorption of solutes will lead to osmotic reabsorption of water. The reabsorption of uh, water will also lead to a reabsorption of some solutes along with this. The, uh, actually, the water carries some solutes uh, with it uh, like sodium and chloride. And the, this drag of solutes along with water is called solvent drag. As sodium, is being, which is, as sodium, which is a positive ion, is being avidly reabsorbed from the early portions of the proximal cannulated tubule, this leads to concentration of a negative ion chloride into the later portions of the proximal cannulated tubule. The initial concentration of chloride in the early portion of proximal cannulated tubule uh, was around 114 milliequivalents per liter. But in the later portions, this concentration increases because of avid reabsorption of sodium and water into the proximal segments. The concentration of chloride increases in the later segments. Also, because a lot of positive ion has been reabsorbed, this also creates an electronegativity in the later portions of the proximal convoluted tubule. This leads to re passive reabsorption of chloride via the paracellular route into the peritubular capillaries. Because of increased reabsorption of sodium and water into the early segments, the concentration of chloride and the negativity increases in the later segments of proximal convoluted tubule, leading to the diffusion of chloride from an area of higher concentration and higher negativity to an area of lower concentration of chloride. This is how chloride is being reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries. Same is the mechanism with urea reabsorption. Because of the option of water in the early portions of the proximal tubule, the concentration of urea increases in the later portions and then this urea moves from area of higher urea concentration to an area of lower urea concentration. But this reabsorption is not that much. We will discuss the reabsorption of urea in detail in other videos. This is how substances are being reabsorbed into the proximal convoluted tubule. Hope it is clear. Now there are some substances which are also secreted by the tubular cells of the proximal cannulated tubule. These substances are secreted by, by the peritubular capillaries into the tubular cells and later into the tubular lumen. What are these substances? A very important substance among all of them is called the para-aminohypuric acid. This substance is also filtered from the glomerulus but this is also secreted by the peritubular capillaries into the tubular lumen. So almost around 90% of the para acid is being secreted. Why this is important? 
this is important to and we will see later okay other substances that are secreted into the tubular uh, lumen by the proximal convoluted tubule include bile salts oxalate and urate and other substances like catecholamines in the proximal convoluted tubule because the substances solutes are reabsorbed along with water so the osmotic pressure in the proximal convoluted tubule remains same as that of the peritubular capillary so it is called as isosmotic as compared to peritubular capillaries or as compared with the plasma